Welcome to the Henrietta Mass Murders, Jesse and Holly McFadden Autopsies Revealed. Welcome to Body of Crime. So we have Jesse and Holly McFadden's autopsies here, and we want to go through them with you guys. Um, one thing that's missing in the request for Jesse McFadden's autopsy is the notes from the examiner, which we're still going to try to obtain. And why is that important? Well, because there's a little bit extra details there. Um, there is significant detail here that we can garner some information from, even as it concerns to the timeline. So we wanted to share that with you guys. Now, this is great. I think this is really going to shed some light on some questions that we've had in terms of maybe potentially time of death, in terms of, you know, what were they tested for, uh, in terms of toxicology and stuff like that. And we're really only focusing on Holly McFadden and on Jesse McFadden as well. Yes. Um, Can we start with Holly McFadden? Can you talk about what you've discovered with Holly? Yes. So what we've discovered with Holly, so everybody knows that Holly was shot three times. So I'm going to talk to you guys about each wound. And these are labeled um, wound A, wound B, and wound C. Wound A would be fairly close to the hairline, given the measurements, at the top of the head and between the center line and left side of the head. So if you're looking at the left side of somebody's forehead, it's going to be in between the center line um, of the forehead, closer to um, the left side. There is what's called stippling on the head that indicates that the muzzle was within two feet of the head when fired. This would mean that more than likely McFadden was probably positioned in front and a little to the left and was right-handed, indicative by the wound being rightward, upward, and forward. And then there's an exit wound not far away, um, a little bit closer to the top of the head, a little bit higher than the entry wound. So that means that the bullet entered and exited. Then there's wound B, which is a contact wound. And the reason that we know that this is a contact wound is because the what shows that the muzzle has been pressed tightly against the head is when soot is found within a wound, And there was soot found within the wound and around the wound with no stippling. Typically, stippling is found outside when there's no contact. The fact that there was um, soot inside the wound indicates that there was a a tight seal. So this would have been held right up against the head. And this was, again, on the left side, but just a little bit further over from the one that we just spoke of before. And this is indicated by the fact that of how the trajectory of this one was, which was that it was forward and upward. And so it just indicates that based on its position, that maybe he would have been positioned in front and a little bit more centered. So he might have moved a little bit or she might have turned a little bit. So then the last wound we're going to talk about, we're going to call it wound C, was fired with a muzzle greater than two feet away, more than likely as there's no stippling or soot identified. This wound is located on the right side of the head and higher than the others. McFadden would be positioned standing and on Holly's right side with the muzzle more than two feet away when fired or shot her when she was on the ground, which makes more sense based on the trajectory. So we're going to talk about that for just a second. So my theory is this. So going through those three wounds, I believe that the contact wound would would be bullet number one. And I believe that because... When you're obviously wanting to, to shoot and, and kill somebody and you're shooting them in the head, more than likely it's going to be close range. For there to be a wound that's up against the head, it's not typical that a second or third or fourth wound would be close contact. I would guess that that were the first. And then I would guess that the second is the other wound to the head that's not far from it, but has a little bit of distance. And I believe that would be from possibly after the first shot where he had the contact where she moved and as she was falling, he fired again and hit her again. That would explain why the wounds were a little bit closer together. And it would also explain the position in which she fell. It also explains the exit wound. So for example, for the first gunshot of B that was pressed against her temple or around the temple area, that bullet was found in, in the occipital portion of the skull, which means there's no exit wound for B. 
Right. I do want to say that it was an upward wound indicating that someone's holding a gun with the right hand aiming a little bit upwards. Right. That was for wound B. That bullet Which we did, believe is wound one. Yeah, which is we believe to be wound one, which did not have an exit wound. Wound A, which we believe to be the second wound, is more in the front of her head as opposed to the side, as if the first gunshot wound spun the head. So the second wound would have went upwards into the forehead. Right. And out through the back of the top of the head almost. Right. Okay. That would have been the second wound. And so the reason that we believe that that the last wound was fired with Holly on the ground is because of the trajectory. So, you know, it makes sense based on the distance. So it was further than two feet away. And it was also fired backwards. And at the angle that it was fired, it's consistent with, with how she was laying. Well, that, that wound would have went in kind of above the ear on the right-hand side, which means the original wounds would have been facing away from the shooter down towards the ground with the right side of the body exposed. And that wound would have came in above the ear and went out through a very top portion of her head, right. which would indicate that she would have been laying on the ground and the wound would have came from above right. downward. If I had to guess, wound B was first. So that's the, that's the wound where we say that there's evidence that the muzzle was against the head. Then A, then C. I believe that wounds B and A occurred standing up and wound C occurred when Holly was on the ground. The abrasions noted are consistent with being moved via dragging close to the time of death. One reason that Holly could have been shot multiple times beyond this being the first time that maybe McFadden had killed someone in this way is that Holly was choking on her own blood as indicated by the details of her lungs, where it says that there's presence of hemoaspiration. And that means that basically that there's blood that she's choking on. So if somebody is making gurgling sounds, you're going to believe that they're still alive. That could have been another reason that, that he shot her more times than everybody else. So he shot her a total of three times. Well, I also think that it's important to note that all the gunshots are extremely high on her head with high exits on the top of the skull. So it's very likely that one gunshot didn't actually kill her. That's actually true. In order for you to be aspirating on blood, you still have to be living. Yeah, so, you have to be breathing. Yeah. That definitely means that she was alive when that was taking place. Something that's kind of interesting is that there is no time of death listed. Something that is listed is that the time that she was found was at 1523. That's military time, and that's 323 p.m. It lists that OSBI notified the examiner and that that was done at 1158. What's interesting about that to me is that the police reported that they were not at the house until around 1, somewhere around 1, a little after 1. So if they weren't there till a little after 1 p.m., why was the medical examiner called at 11:58 a.m.? So that's a little bit a little bit fishy to me. Maybe it's a typo, I don't know, but it seems a little bit fishy to me. Some of the things that are listed concerning Holly that are telling of possibly when she passed away is there's a portion on the autopsy where they talk about the description of the body and they talk about rigor mortis. So rigor mortis is when your body stiffens after you die. And it takes place in phases and it takes place the same phase that it presents itself is also the same order and in the same phase that it also disappears when it does. And so there's a timing for that. After a person dies, rigor mortis occurs within one to 10 hours. Then after one to 10 hours, this is when it starts and it's fully developed within 10 to 12 hours. It's steady after that point. So your rigor mortis is set in. It's been 10 to 12 hours. And now you're going to maintain that state for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. Now, at around between 12 to 24 hours, this can take place around 20 by 24 hours, rigor mortis begins to disappear. And like I said, in the same order that it appeared. And typically it starts with like the eyelids and basically moves, moves from the head down. So then as it disappears, as it's passing, it's going to pass in the same manner. 
So when you see an autopsy and you see them say which pieces of the body are present when they talk about which part of rigor state they're at, it's indicating where they're seeing that state present in those parts of the body. So that lets you know how far developed it is into the stage that they're indicating. So between 24 and 36 hours, the rigor mortis is disappearing. And by 36 hours is when the body's decomposing. Now, mind you that there's a pretty big time span in between each phase. So can somebody realistically, you know, their rigor mortis started at, you know, one to 10 hours, but maybe, um, maybe by 12 hours already, the rigor mortis is beginning to disappear. That could quite possibly happen. So there could be a fairly decent amount of time that you can kind of say, this is when the time of death occurred based on if maybe they experienced these things earlier than some people. Because again, there's no like set time, like at 12 hours, this is going to happen. There's a little bit of a range. So it's approximate. But one of the things with Holly is that they list that she is in a stage of passing. And what this means is that she's already completed her rigor mortis stage, meaning that she, all of her body had already stiffened and now her body is starting to loosen. So that indicates that she's been dead longer than somebody where their body hasn't fully hardened yet. The different areas of the body haven't hardened or stiffened. So she's listed as passing, which means she hasn't completely passed, which means she shouldn't show signs of decomposing, but she should show that there's some areas of her body that are still stiffened while other areas of her body higher up on her torso or higher up on her body are loosening. So her eyelids shouldn't be firm. You know, maybe her neck won't be firm. And so as they're talking about that passing, whichever body parts they're indicating as being part of that would indicate which areas are loose. And on her autopsy summary, they do indicate the jaw, the neck, the arms and the legs. So the last thing to see um, loosen up would be the toes. So and they don't list the toes on here, the feet, but those would be the last things that you would see loosen up. And then once that happens, then that's when they go into the decomposing phase. And there's some things that can speed this up or slow this down, such as heat, he can make a person decompose faster. So this process can happen a little bit faster. If you've ever heard of the FBI farm, one of the things that they do is they put bodies in different areas, different temperature levels, different situations, maybe in water, maybe in dirt, um, so that they can kind of try to gauge time of death better. And so um, I just want you to know that those are some of the things that can kind of alter these times a little bit. And of course, they list the manner of death as homicide. So based on that information that we just spoke about and talking about the rigor mortis, it puts Holly's time of death at a certain time. And that time is April 30th at 3.23 a.m. to April 30th, 3.23 p.m. And why is that interesting? That's interesting because it's a very close time of death to McFadden's. And now right now, we don't have this information on the, on the kids, so we can't compare this to the kids right now. But this leads me to believe that he killed Holly within a short fairly short time span of when he killed himself. It makes me wonder in what order he killed everybody in. So really the other details that are listed about Holly. So there's abrasions that they point out and the abrasions that they point out are actually, um, they list them on the, are bilateral, which means both sides of the arms and the legs. This is very consistent with dragging somebody. Whether you're dragging them by their arms, whether you're dragging them by their legs, depending on how you're dragging them, there can be some abrasions. They do list the wrist specifically, which means that she could have had a, she could have been bound um, at least by one wrist. They only list one, but that's not a given because it, it doesn't indicate that. But definitely abrasions are consistent with dragging, moving of the body. So I would guess that Holly was one of the bodies that had been moved from its original place. When an autopsy is done, they check everything. They check your GI tract. They check your heart, your, your gallbladder, your pancreas, all of those things. The only things that were abnormal were in her lungs. They listed the hemo aspiration, which is blood that you're aspirating on. And then they listed that she didn't have a gallbladder, that that wasn't identified. So she probably had that removed at some point. 
And other than that, her autopsy is normal to include, um, they did do an exam on her genitalia. It was all normal. There was nothing like to indicate that anything forceful was done or anything of that nature. And lastly, for the tox screen. So one thing that I found very interesting in the tox screen is this. So there's a number of different tox screens that you could perform. Even in the hospital, they only perform typically a certain type of tox screen unless there's something specific that they're looking for. For instance, when you get a drug test done, it doesn't just show steroids. Steroids is a specific test that they test for. So not every drug is tested on every test, but with the test that they did, they did not test for THC, which is marijuana. I find this to be very strange being that one of the things that they found in the home was marijuana gummies. So it's odd to me The fact that you found marijuana gummies, this is a murder investigation, and you didn't check for marijuana. Why? Why did you not do that? That makes no sense to me at all. But then they did test for alcohol. They tested for other drugs like like cocaine, and they tested for heroin. They did. Right? But they didn't test for THC. Nope. And the only things that they found... Her tox screen was negative. Her blood alcohol was negative. She didn't have any any alcohol in her system. The only thing that was positive for her was fentermine and cytolopram. And fentermine is a drug that's generally given for weight loss. And it's kind of considered like an upper drug that can spike your heart rate. And for some people, it helps boost their metabolism. It works to help you lose weight. And then the other drug, cytolopram or Celexa is the other name for it. It's commonly used for depression or for eating disorders such as uh, bulimia. So if you're bulimic, um, it's a drug that you can be taken. So I don't know her medical history. Obviously, her medical history isn't part of this, but her medical history would probably indicate that she either was depressed or had an eating disorder. And the fact that she's taking phenamine for weight loss would tell me that more than likely it was for depression and not an eating disorder. Yeah. Because I don't think that those two would be prescribed together. They shouldn't be. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So now we'll go into um, Jesse McFadden. And like I said, his doesn't have the notes, which they should, and we're requesting those, but um, we will go over his. So for Jesse's exam, one of the things that is interesting is that obviously we know that he committed suicide. And according to the autopsy, which they don't give a whole lot of details on because they didn't include the notes, They list that OSBI was contacted at the same time. Makes sense because they're going to contact him at the same time for everybody. They also list the time of him being found as the same time. And obviously we know that they were found together. So that also makes sense. His rigor mortis is different. Obviously that's to be expected because he killed himself last. So his is listed as complete, which means that He's past the phase of it developing and it's completed, which means his body is fully stiff at this point. So when they found Jesse McFadden, his body was stiff. His body had no signs of having loosened anywhere, which means he was killed last. And the reason that we have this timeline is based on those stages and the hours in which they occur. And then also the fact that the last message he sent out was just before 8 p.m. from his phone that we're aware of. And that was sent to Caitlin Lindsay Babb, his um, second survivor and the woman that's a part of the case that was pending when he was released from prison and should not have been and contacted her just before 8 p.m. So his time of death, we have between April 30th at approximately just before 8 p.m. to possibly May 1st at 5.23 a.m. That's based on the time frame and rigor mortis where he was those are the possible times of death in between those times so basically what this means is that holly potentially died very close to when jesse mcfadden died because of their rigor mortis so it leaves me to speculate when the kids might have died and i'm curious to see if holly died before or after the kids honestly because of how close her time of death is to mcfadden's death Again, Holly's time of death would have been on April 30th, which was Sunday, in between 3.23 a.m. and 3.23 p.m. And then McFadden's death could have been anywhere between a little before 8 p.m. And the reason that we say that is because that's when he contacted Caitlin Babb. So that same day. So 
let's say he did kill her at the latest time of her death based on her rigor mortis. Um, let's say he killed her at 3.23 p.m. He wouldn't have killed himself until in between 7.50 p.m. on Sunday to possibly May 1st at 5.23 a.m. So we know based on his rigor mortis that he could possibly have been alive up until Monday morning at 5.23 a.m. But I would speculate that he killed himself after the messages with Caitlin Babb. And the reason I believe that is because he called his mom before that. I want to say um, the time for calling his mom was somewhere around 6 p.m. And then this would have been his last phone call from his phone that we're aware of. And if that's the case, then that leaves me to believe that um, the earliest that he could have killed himself was somewhere around 8 p.m. to 5.23 a.m. Now, his autopsy reveals, obviously, the, the one gunshot wound. And when it shows the completion of the, of the rigor mortis in his body, it shows that it's the entire body. So he hasn't started that phase of the passing phase. And it shows that he put the gun in his mouth and placed it against the palate, which would be the upper portion of your mouth, inside your mouth, when he fired the gun. That's how he fired it. His talk screen was negative. He had no alcohol. He had no drugs. And again, there was no test for marijuana, which I just, that just blows me away. They don't list any further injuries for him. Again, there's no notes with this, which we're still going to try to get a hold of and update you guys on. But that's it. That's all that we have for both Jesse and Holly. Jesse and Holly. Jesse. <laughs> And that's a wrap on today's investigation, fellow detectives. If you found this episode both enlightening and captivating, then please subscribe to our podcast show and our Patreon. Leave a review and hit that like button. Share our podcast with others and engage with us on our website and social media platforms. You can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as our website at www.bodyofcrimepodcast.com where you can access all of our episodes and bonus content, including valuable resources. By expanding our community, we believe we can make a greater impact in our pursuit of truth and in shedding light on crucial cases. If there's a case that you'd like for us to cover or a personal story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate and contact us through our website. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. Until next time, stay sharp, and thank you for tuning in to the Body of Crime Podcast. Podcast. Bye.